You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T H O M P S O N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. Okay, Jan Thompson at hort dot net. I see. Is that Jan as in J A N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J A double N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J A double N T H O M P S O N at hort dot net. Much obliged. And could I ask, do you have your referee details to hand? Yes. What do you need? I need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague. Okay, for a work reference, there's Jane Foot. She's my former boss at Bermuda Girls School, head of English. Okay. My personal referee is Monica Carbody. Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs. Foot. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher. But are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute. Though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing, it's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down: C A M B R I D G E S H I R E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of sort of salary can I? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember the most important rule of driving: safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now, what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly. Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. 
I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec, is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact, introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. OK. Well, how are we going to organise this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. 
Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak, for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.